All right. In the second point of chapter 15, we're going to learn about the second factor that affects the reaction rate. We learned about the reaction reactant concentration in the first part. Now we're going to learn about the effect of temperature. So there's this equation called the Arrhenius equation, which represents the rate constant as a factor of temperature and activation energy. So we have this equation here, of course, we'll be given on the exams and we're going to learn more about it during the real lecture, but you have A times E to the negative EA, which is the activation energy of a reaction divided by R. So that's our ideal gas constant. It's back. And now it's in the form, since we're dealing with energy, it's in the form of 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And then you have multiplied by time, which is your temperature in Kelvin all the time. So here is an example of what activation energy is. You have energy of a certain amount of reactants. And in order to proceed with the reaction, in order for the reaction to occur, a certain energy threshold must be met. The, a, lot of these, a lot of the times these reactions don't happen spontaneously. Like if you have two oxygen atoms that go together to form O2, that happens spontaneously. But most reactions don't, such as um, taking two very stable gases that are fine by themselves, which is H2 and O2, and combining them to make H2O. This doesn't happen spontaneously, and it needs energy for it to form its products. So that energy threshold is called the activation energy. And of course, it's measured in joules, just like we know energy is. So you have the activation energy. Then you have this thing called the activated complex, which um, it really represents the transition state between the reactants and the products by the formation of partial bonds. And here's an example of one of those happening, where you have uh, a, a simple reaction that, of just a rearrangement of atoms, which any chemical reaction is a rearrangement of atoms, but um, more specifically, we have isomerization. So in this case, where you have methyl isonitrile, which is CH3, single bond to N, triple bond to C. If you have the switching of the carbon and nitrogen to make an isomer into the CH3, C, triple bond N, this, this is a chemical reaction and it and it requires some energy. So what needs to happen is CH3N needs to break and a bond for the CH3C needs to form. And this thing needs to rotate. This thing, meaning the uh, N triple bond C needs to rotate. So in order for that to happen, this needs to break and this needs to form. So we can represent that in an energy diagram. Just to be brief, you have the activated complex where you have partial bonds in part of the rotation, which is where the activation energy needs to be met. And then you have our final delta H of the reaction, delta H of formation, where it's just the, where it's just the difference between the energy to start and the energy to finish. In this case, it's an exothermic reaction, because if you see the energy at the beginning is greater than the energy at the end, meaning the reaction loses energy. Something else that we can look at is the Arrhenius factor. So the exponential factor where you have um, E to negative EART. So basically you can think about it in your head as what happens to the rate constant, meaning K equals A times this factor, when you increase um, activation energy, decrease it, increase temperature, decrease it. You can think about that because this factor, it's E to the negative. This basically means it's one over E to the EART over RT. So if you increase the activation energy, that decreases the rate constant. And if you increase the temperature, that increases the rate constant. And that makes sense looking at it from a physical, a physical uh, perspective, because if you increase activation energy, the reaction is going to happen slower, right? Because it takes longer and a longer amount of time for that reaction to reach the threshold. And that makes sense because the rate constant would be lower. If you increase temperature, that would increase the rate constant and increase the reaction rate because you're gonna increase temperature, you increase the speed of the molecules, you're gonna increase their frequency of collision, and of course, uh, the reaction rate. So we can summarize that by that, um, by that factor. Um, also, you can linearize the Arrhenius equation, and just like we did for the rate law, the integrated rate laws, you can integrate it, and you can come up with this linear plot of the natural log of the rate constant times negative EA over R times one over your temperature as a function of one over temperature plus the natural log of A, which is your Arrhenius constant. So um, you can factor that and the equation of the natural log of K versus one over T happens to be a straight line. And you can use that to solve different questions. And 
you can have a two-point variant of this equation, which again, will be given on the exam and can be used to solve equations and questions just like this one. So you can try this one on your own and we'll do it during lecture. And then here's a question. So reaction A and B have identical frequency factors. So the frequency factor is the A. So let me just write the equation one more time, the Arrhenius equation. So you have A times E to the negative EA over RT. Now A is our frequency factor, right? But we have reaction B has a higher activation energy than reaction A. Which reaction has a greater rate constant at room temperature? So temperature is constant. And if you have higher activation energy, the one with, the one with higher activation energy means the rate constant is going to be lower, as we said before. So that means reaction A, which has the lower activation energy, will have the higher rate constant. Then you have collision theory, which basically means the, these chemical reactions occur by colliding, right? Molecules collide, but they have to collide in the right orientation. So that's, there's a lot of slides on this, but that's the general meaning of it, that you, can have, you need to have a certain arrangement, for a certain orientation for them to collide. So you see how two, two of these molecules collided backwards and it didn't work, but then when they collide in the right orientation, that's when the complex forms. And we can represent this by we know A is our frequency factor, but it can be broken down into our orientation factor times our collision frequency. Now that's, they might give you numbers like that. In that case, you plug it in, but that's not, don't go overboard with that. So you need an effective collision. So you need your um, orientation of the molecules to be correct. And then here's an example. So of, here's kind of general question you would get on that. Uh, which reaction do you expect to have the smallest orientation factor? And it would be the one that has the least amount of commotion or, or that would require the least amount of, or this way, the one that will have the most likelihood of randomly colliding in the correct orientation. In other words, the most simple one. You have H, singular, singular monatomic hydrogen and monatomic iodine. No matter what their orientation is, they're both spheres. That means they're gonna collide in any orientation, it works perfectly. Even though H2 and I2 are both symmetrical, most of the time they'll co collide in the right configuration. But compared to HI, these will all the time collide in the right configuration because they're just singular monatomic. So that's our answer. Then you have reaction mechanisms. So uh, a reaction mechanism is individual steps that can be summed up into the entire reaction. So for example, it kind of like Hess's law. So you have the overall reaction and then you have the different mechanisms. And once these mechanisms are added up, they lead to the overall reaction. So it's kind of like stepwise process. And everything that's in the middle, every one of those other reactions are called reaction intermediates. So that kind of gets into the Hess's law. And then there is what we can learn, and we're going to spend some time on this, is the number of reactant particles that form these, in, these uh, complete reactions, not the intermediates, we can, we can talk about their molecularity. So what this means is how many steps are going to be involved. So um, a unimolecular step involves one particle, a bimolecular step involves two particles, a termolecular step involves three particles. So what we can do is we can figure out a chart from this, and here's our rate law in terms of your elementary steps. So if you see different steps, you can categorize their molecularity, and from there, you can determine their rate law. So if you have a simple step where you have one product, one reactant forms one product, one or more product, you have a molecularity of one. And the rate law is K times the concentration of A. If you have two of the same, it's Ka squared. If you have two different ones, it's Ka times B. If you have three, it's Ka cubed. And you can see how that works there. Now, don't confuse this with determining the rate law of a reaction, because this is for reaction mechanisms. To determine the rate law for a normal reaction that we've went over, you need to know the data. You need to have experimental evidence, so such as the rate at different concentrations or uh, a tangent line or a graph showing the rate, the react reactant concentration going up and going down of the other one. But you cannot just use, oh, it goes A to B or it goes uh, A to B. It has to be Ka. 
Well, you need to know the rate. You need to know the rates at certain concentrations to know that. But for your elementary steps, meaning in your reactant, your uh, mechanisms, it's okay to assume this molecularity. And also, it'll specifically ask sometimes for molecularity or it'll tell you that. Now, what is the rate law for the elementary step? So it tells you these key terms, elementary step, molecularity, intermediates, reactant, uh, unimolecular, bimolecular, things like that. So for this elementary step, you have A plus B equals a product. So it would be just simply K times A times B. So it's pretty easy. It's a lot, I think it's easier than just the normal reaction um, rate law. Then you can have the, we're going to talk about the rate determining step, which means it's the slowest of the steps in an entire reaction mechanism. So for example, if you have this mechanism where this is the overall equation, and then you have two reaction intermediates, which is equation one and two, this one is the slow reaction. This one is the fast reaction. They will tell you this information. And the slow reaction determines the rate of the entire equation, because if you look at the rate of the entire um, equation, the, the whole reaction, it's dependent on just the rate of the slowest one, right? Because that is what the entire mechanism depends on. It's kind of like you're only as slow as your weakest link or you're only as fast as your weakest link. And that's exactly true. So from determining the rates of the individual steps, you can determine the rate of the entire reaction based on whichever one's the slowest. So here's just an example of that where you have, this is your higher activation energy, which means step one is determines the overall rate because the other one happens quickly, more quickly. So what we can do is if you have a more complex mechanism, such as this three-step mechanism where you have a the slow rate for mechanism for reaction two, and here's the overall reaction, your, again, your overall rate observed will be the rate of the slowest reaction, which is reaction two. And then you can do some math and figure things out. So basically what's happening here is since this, since the first reaction is an equilibrium reaction, meaning it goes in both directions, you can have two equations. You have the rate going forward equals the rate going backwards. So that would be K1 equals this. And then K1 minus K minus one means, means the same K, but it's going the other direction. And then equals the products going backwards. So the rate forward equals the rate reverse. Then you can do some math and you can figure things out. And then you can have an equation to figure out the overall rate law by plugging these, plugging these definitions into the overall observed reaction rate. So that's why this K observed is different than the K of the, or sorry, the rate observed is different than the overall reaction rate for the slowest one, because we use this math to plug it in. So um, that's possible too. Then we can talk about catalyst, which is the last thing. Basically what a catalyst does is a substance that speeds up the rate of the reaction without being consumed itself. So it being present increases the chances of collision. So it makes them happen faster. And you can see with a catalyst, the activation energy is a lot lower. So it lowers the activation energy. That's the main definition. Different types of catalysts. There are heterogeneous catalysts, which are in the same phase as the reactants. Then there's homogeneous catalysts, which are a different phase. So sometimes you have metal. So sometimes you have like this uh, platinum catalyst in a gas or in a, in a liquid that helps the reactants meet faster. And then for and heterogeneous catalyst, an example of that is an enzyme. It helps the substrates get closer together. So here's just some examples of catalysts. And then enzymes are um, biological catalysts. And you have an active site of an enzyme. The substrate would then bind to the enzyme and to make an enzyme substrate complex, which then forms the product after the substrate reacts. And this happens extremely quickly. This happens in seconds, where sometimes if you leave the reaction in a, like a biological reaction, let's say two a, a protein and another protein, and it needs an enzyme to bind together, if you leave them there, sometimes it can take 10,000 years, but the enzyme makes it, happens, make, makes it happen in seconds.
So that's the efficiency of these kind of enzymatic catalysts. And I could talk about this all day, but hopefully it's a good overview getting into next week and uh, see you in class.